Linguistics can actually be pretty confusing if you think about it. More confusing than that is how our brains even work. One day we went from grunting and understanding those grunts, which were exceedingly basic, which by the way, we actually kind of still do that now to be honest with you. What's that noise that you make when you're eating food and you have food in your mouth and then someone asks if it's good? You're gonna tell me you don't sit there and make the same exact satiated caveman or cavewoman noise. Exactly. But after going from a bunch of regular apes to a bunch of anxiety-ridden hyper-intelligent apes, at some point we eventually created language. Upon doing so, we immediately started using it to figure out how to convey ideas, tell where the saber tooths were, where the caribou wasn't, until it finally culminated into its ultimate pinnacle that we know that it would reach, talking smack in Call of Duty lobbies in 2008. But the concept of language itself is something that as long as you really don't think about how it works, why it works, or even how it started working in the first place, it doesn't seem that deep, but it really is. Take into consideration things like aphasia, for instance, where you almost forget how to communicate and can't understand languages you once knew as the most basic basic portion of life, you begin to understand how fragile its being actually is. In Ontario, in a small town of Pontypool, which everyone and their mother for some reason was asking me to cover this all of a sudden, an unknown disease would begin infecting the actual English language. Nobody is quite sure about what is happening, but it appears as though there are trigger words that will send people into a trance of some sort before ultimately turning them into shambling destructive masses known as conversationalists, who go on spreading the good word to others to convert them. So obviously the question is, how did this happen? Well, currently I have to tell you, my work is kind of cut out for me on this one. So let's get into exactly what is happening with the language disease, what may have been the catalyst for all this, and how the human brain may have been tricked into harming itself. But first, this episode is sponsored by Factor. Are you ready for wholesome eating made simple? Well, with their menus updated weekly with more than 27 meals and 33 add-on options, you could choose your favorite meal, whether it be keto, calorie smart, chef's choice, vegan, and veggie options, along with seafood, meat, and plant-based meats. So look, we all know, abs aren't made in the gym, they're actually made in the kitchen. And it being summer, there's quite a few pictures of me floating around where I'm like, man, I probably should start eating better. And if not just for pure vanity, then also from a health perspective, as I've crossed a threshold into my 30s, which is horrifying how fast time passes. But anyhow, with Factor, I can achieve healthy eating at an affordable price. That's because Factor makes meeting your diet and nutrition goals a snap by delivering fresh, never frozen dietitian designed meals right to your doorstep. Plus, considering it only takes two minutes to reheat the food, I'm never that far away from a completely nutritious meal. It's also pretty filling. And considering that I also enjoy weightlifting, I can amp up my Factor order with add ons like protein, juices, energy bites, veggie sides, and even desserts. So, heading to go.factor75.com for slash Roanoke120 and using code Roanoke120, you can get $120 off. Plus, you've probably seen me work with HelloFresh before. Well, Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, so it's literally that easy to order these meals. So again, heading to go.factor75.com forward slash Roanoke120 and using code Roanoke120, you can get $120 off your order today. All right, let's get back to it. So we kick off our story like we usually do, but you can't see the scripts I write. It begins with a typo, but in reality, it's just Pontypool. Our main character, Grant Mazzy, begins talking about how a lost cat named Honey is being looked for. Honey has gone missing across a bridge, but then he starts breaking down the surname of the cat, and honestly, it starts sounding like gibberish if you don't have a point of reference, which I'm fairly certain it's designed to be this way to warm up your Warnicke's area to go ahead and put that area on high alert as to why what he's saying sounds strange. Probably because it's a mixture of French and English, but anyhow, as Grant drives along in a snowstorm, he's yelling at his agent as he fires him over the phone as apparently it's not been enough for Grant to just be working. As he pulls up to a red light, he begins trying to reach for his phone again as he's receiving a call. But then a woman appears at his window, yelling into it, but Grant can't understand her. As he asks who she is, she begins repeating what he says before disappearing back out into the snow. This is important as it disproves an idea discussed as a possible vector for the disease. Grant then pulls up into work, which is just the basement of a church, which this is basically where we'll be hanging out the rest of the time. As he walks in, we meet Laurel Ann, who appears to be the sound engineer, as Grant then heads into the booth to start the morning show. Knowing that the people are still listening because radio isn't actually a complete joke at this point, because now it's really nothing but commercials, or you know what, maybe it was, I just, I don't know, I just refuse to listen to radio now. Spotify and Bluetooth FTW. But Grant immediately begins launching into the story about the strange experience he had with the woman this morning. He then goes on about the weather, where we now meet Sydney, who appears to be the manager of said radio station, and then Ken, who is said to be hovering above the clouds right now in the sunshine chop. 
chopper, but he's really just sitting on top of a hill overlooking the city in his Dodge Dart. How can you see the rest of the town during a snowstorm? Well, they don't pay me enough to discern that information. Sydney yells at Grant to basically leave Ken alone, but as he does, they apparently just had a marijuana bust with two people. Sydney attempts to get Grant to stop once more as it's a small town and everyone knows one another. And Grant is just making pretty much everyone angry at this point, but really though, that's not important. Or it is. There's a ton of different metaphors in this movie that you'll see. It's kind of hard to figure out which ones are important and which ones aren't. Grant now goes back to his original story about the woman he saw on the way to work. He gives his number to call the station to give him information on it. As people begin calling, Laurel Ann is the first to identify people are not making sense. Over the police scanner, a hostage situation begins to be broadcasted, except it turns out to not really be a situation at all, as literally as the story is breaking, it just sort of resolves itself, except also not really. As Sydney talks to Laurel Ann, she tells her that the sheriff is absolutely freaked out over what happened and wants them to drop the story entirely. Laurel Ann now gets a call from Ken. A large group of people have gathered outside of Dr. Mendez's office. As Ken goes over the radio, he talks about how 100 people are outside of the office attempting to break in, which they end up doing. It sounds like some sort of outbreak of something, but again, we are stuck in the church's basement, which that doesn't sound nefarious at all, but Ken appears quite distraught over what he's seeing. Grant seems to believe it's some sort of riot, but then we get the worst timing imaginable. Lawrence and the Arabians have come all this way to sing. This causes a bit of discussion over which is more important. Obviously, Lawrence and the Arabians are the most important. As they continue to sing, one girl appears to be having issues exactly remembering how the song ends. She discusses how it's just repeating over and over again in her mind, but she can't remember its ending. She begins repeating the word, but she's just sort of stuck. Grant discusses how it was a little weird, but it's about to get a whole lot more weird out there. Grant goes live to a man named Steve, but all they hear is yelling in the background. Sydney tries to tell Grant she thinks people are screwing with them, and then Laurel Ann gets a call, but again, she can't understand them. As the story develops further, 75 people have dropped so far. The constable comes on to say people were repeating things, talking crazy, and in general, just not making any sense. Now a herd has formed near the edge of the forest. People are getting trapped in their cars under literal mountains of people. The BBC has now contacted the small radio station, and oh thank god, this should clear up everything with no biases. The BBC launches into what they're saying is due to disagreements between the English-speaking Canadians and the French-speaking Canadians. The BBC relates it back to that, basically just assuming it's what it is. And by the way, I will always crap on the BBC because three years ago they copyright hit one of my videos over the Metro Bear because I used a three-second clip of a hyena. It was pretty outrageous. I mean, it was just a hyena sitting there. Anyhow, they suggest it's an insurgency of some kind, but Grant talks them off that point, but it's the news, so they just kind of sensationalize it and say that's what it is anyways. Grant now gets back in contact with Ken, who says it's not safe there. He ran from his Dodge Dart as the people are after him. The infected apparently have wild eyes and they look terrified. The group finds a person and then turns basically into a frenzy of piranha and tear them apart. Ken keeps running through the silo where he finds a teenager. Ken then approaches him despite Grant saying it's probably not a good idea. The teenager is repeating something as then a French broadcast interrupts. It says to stay away from family members and refrain from all terms of endearment such as honey, talking with children, and rhetorical discourse. Then at the end, it says do not translate this message into English. Whoops. So on air, Grant just said a term of endearment as Sydney immediately gets on her phone and talks with a man named Bob Roseland, who then tells her that they have to stay quarantined. So Ken is now back on the radio. Ken is next to the teenager and apparently it sounds like a child screaming when he breathes. Now what even is this? Honestly, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, I have no idea. Unless his meat suit is so broken that that's just the only thing he can do between wheezing, which I mean it is entirely possible. Ken does talk about how he is basically completely screwed up. This could possibly be due to a regression caused by a traumatic brain injury. But as Grant sits there, he appears to look rather confused as to what's happening. Sydney goes in there to tell him that Nigel healing, apparently, which doesn't seem like a sentence. This causes Grant to freak out, telling her she's not making any sense, which appears to bring her back. Grant continues to have a freak out and says that he needs to get out of there. Laurel Ann posts the missing cat tape as Grant then goes to GTFO. He begins to think that basically because this is a new job, everyone has to be screwing with him. He yells at the women and then goes to leave, but as he does, he heads outside and Laurel Ann spots people coming towards them. On the outside of the church, they begin repeating what Grant says. They decide to now head back down to the radio room where Grant now reads off everyone else who has gotten got by everyone else. As Laurel Ann and Sydney talk with one another, Laurel Ann starts slowly at first, but then begins messing up the placement of words. As Sydney goes to take the kettle off the burner, Laurel Ann starts monotoning in the corner like a total weirdo as a man crawls through the window like a total weirdo. Turns out to be Dr. Mendez, who has crawled through town. He spots what Laurel Ann is doing and then says she's about to turn. This is what they do before they want to spread the influence of the disease. Heading into the radio booth, they really don't know what is happening, but Laurel Ann comes up to 
door, talking complete nonsense once more, as her Broca's area appears to be completely wrecked at this point. Dr. Mendez says that she's actually hunting them at this point, and she needs to spread what she is feeling. But it's soundproof, so she can't hear them, and they can't hear her, so she loses track of them and then walks off. As they continue to talk, Laurel M begins running into the glass to get everyone else. Mendez begins talking about what he's seeing. He says that he's actually seen this at his clinic, but has no idea if they will end up just expiring if they can't transfer the sickness. Ken finally gets back on the phone with Sydney as crowds have been passing him apparently for the last hour, yelling about looking out for U-boats and repeating these things, and it must be a symbol of the disorder. Dr. Mendez retorts that he means symptom, which now Ken is suffering from the same disease. He begins stumbling over his words as he loses his grasp on the English language and just repeats the last thing he hears, which is simple. As they hang up, Sydney begins crying, but says that she knew him, but she would never let his kids go near him, which was completely at random. But this also appears to not be what she wanted to say. Laurel Ann is outside the window now, bleeding and foaming at the mouth. Mendez now has a breakthrough as he figures out that the words themselves are contaminated. This would create an entire new order of life if something that never existed simply came to be as it sprung out of consciousness by communication. Which, hey, they say ideas can be infectious. Mendez goes on to say it requires us to understand the word for the virus to take hold. So now things continue to devolve as people are getting more desperate to break through the doors. At this point, Sydney gets a call from her child breaking the second rule of the French broadcast as Laurel Ann continues to run at the window. Having physical manifestations of this conscious disease, it appears as though, being the sound engineer, she does still possess knowledge of how things work and rips the wires on the radio. As they continue to watch Laurel Ann, well, we now see what happens if you can't infect others as she vomits up blood all over the glass. Now, others have arrived to take Laurel Ann's place as they begin beating on the glass trying to get in and infect the other three. They now decide to write to one another rather than speak as not to attract too much attention. They decide that throwing their voice is going to be the best option as Grant gets on the radio saying that Sydney Breyer is alive and it's played over the loudspeaker and then gets the attention of the conversationalist beating on the booth. But the doctor then begins having issues, but as he speaks, he switches back over to his native language, which excites him. He's able to talk his way out of the effects of the disease as long as he moves back into his native language, which now Grant and Sydney begin speaking in French to one another. As they walk upstairs, one of the Arabians from earlier begins her attack, repeating the last thing that she heard Sydney just say. And then they're forced to end her before she's able to infect. Grant blames Sydney for taking out the kid and says that, well, since you already took her out, you should take out the doctor as well. She basically says no, and then Grant's like, okay, well, I'll take credit for ending the kid, and then tells Sydney, so now you have to take out the doctor. I don't know, it made me laugh. But just then, the Canadian National Anthem starts playing, which then breaks up the loop that they were using to attract the crowd. So now the crowd is coming back towards then. Dr. Mendez at this point nopes out, but only to save them. So now the group is chanting Sydney Breyer is alive. So as Sydney and Grant sit in the storage room, they begin discussing how they even understand language and why people are repeating it. Well, they track it down to it must be an immune response of some sort. They're repeating to words to make it not make sense anymore, but that's not stopping the understanding of the word. So because of that, they need to change the meaning of the word itself in order to get the understanding of it to cease, thus ending the disease associated with that word. But as Sydney states this, she starts getting stuck on the word kill. So she starts freaking out as anyone would, but Grant is trying to figure out how to stop it. Kill isn't kill doesn't work. Then he goes for the opposite. Kill is good, but that doesn't work. So then he goes with kill is kiss. This gets her off the ledge before she completely loses it rather than taking Grant out, which was kill. It's now kiss. So you can't go the opposite. You can't just really forget the word. You literally have to change your understanding of the word. So they head back to the booth. He goes on the mic talking about how terms of endearment are the danger and so is baby talk. As a result, he begins disproving all the words that we know. Meanwhile, on the surface, everything is going to crap as the military is moving in to contain the infection. As Grant yells stop, the military then listens, apparently, as the battle stops above. He begins talking gibberish, which appears to work as it's the end of the day. But while that's happening, a countdown begins playing in French, leaving us unsure of what happened. Or does it? We get some radio signals of others who have come to because of what Grant pulled off that requires people to completely change their understanding of English as all signals appear to be gibberish as well. Not making much sense, but this is the only way for the language to exist as it does now. But Grant and Sydney have survived. In another area of the planet, they are now known as Johnny Deadeyes and Lisa the Killer. So, I'm not gonna lie to you, shortly after writing this, I had to go take a nap and think about how this even would work. With a traditional understanding of biology, pathophysiology of illnesses, and how the brain works and understands the world around it, we're gonna have to get mildly ethereal with this explanation as it requires something which has no basis, at least with our current understanding of consciousness, so that means what the sweet hell is happening. As always, we will start with what we know about the disease and then move into vectors along with how the brain deals with this or really doesn't deal well with it, which should lend some clues 
clues on the physical impact it has on the human body before moving into a few possible scenarios as to where this would have even arisen. So let's start from the beginning. What does this disease do exactly? To form this, we need to take a look at what it's doing to those who have become afflicted with this unknown disease. When a person hears the word that triggers their brain to begin its downward spiral, it doesn't immediately happen. In fact, there are a few hints and events that happen just prior to the person completely losing it. While they have a look of fear, this denotes that consciously they are still in there somewhat. Their brains are still functioning, however, they have lost a major corresponding factor associated with hearing. This is the ability to understand. When the disease seeps in, at first it sounds like every once in a while someone misplaced a word, or maybe you just didn't hear them correctly. Because of this, you would likely just ignore it and move on as, hey, we all mishear some things, sometimes it happens. Like, have you ever had someone explain to you something three times and you just end up saying screw it because you really don't want to ask for a fourth explanation as their frustration increases? So you just kind of go and you try to figure it out. Likely this would happen. However, this does show us the first mistake versus when the disease symptoms fully hit, meaning it's not an immediate overwhelming of the brain, but may actually be something like into a slow burn that increases in speed over time. So as time goes on, the person who originally heard that trigger word will begin to have more and more difficulty understanding others until they themselves can no longer speak and begin repeating words over and over again to no avail. Once this happens, the person is gone. As made mentioned by Dr. Mendez, they still begin hunting for others in order to spread auditory disease to sort of like relieve themselves, but their consciousness in say like our capacity is disrupted. By spreading the disease, it's somehow apparently prolonging their own life in some capacity as when they cannot spread it in the case of Laurel Ann, they will vomit up blood as their body physically breaks down, meaning that there are two versions of this disease. There's the version that turns them into conversationalists, which that means they will try to talk to others. Then there's those that were isolated who literally physically degrade, which will kind of cover both. With the disease outline, the question becomes what really was the vector that caused all of this? After looking into it myself, there seems to be this running theory that Grant was actually the vector that started it all. Coming from somewhere else, he said something that ended up causing the outbreak to begin here first before spreading it to other locations. I half disagree, half agree with this. I think to a degree, he helped propagate the spread of the disease by reading off the translated message on the radio. But all that did was warn people about the triggers that were going to cause the disease, which does not suggest the vector was that. Instead, they had a looped message of the cat being lost, its name, where it was last seen, all of that. This is truly what caused the outbreak to begin. While Grant unwittingly played into this, it's not like anyone could have actually known. So why do I believe this is the original vector? Well, Grant is basically cleared at being the cause at the beginning of the movie. When he pulls up to the light, a woman approaches clearly already influenced by this new form of disease. She's already in the deep stages too, as she attempted to infect Grant, but he couldn't hear her. When he rolled down his window, she began repeating what he said, showing that she was already mentally gone. The relating topic to how this disease started has to be then something that unified people. And we know the missing cat poster was played on the radio, was up all over town, and everyone there had to read it. So the question now becomes, what exactly happens to the brain and why is it producing this result? To understand this, we must understand the anatomy of the brain. And here's where things kind of get a little philosophical, but hang in there. It's going to get way worse later. Are humans the sum of our parts or are we something more? Some would say that we are more. Others would say that we aren't. But regardless of what you believe, it's truly difficult to wrap your mind around the fact that you know you have a brain, your brain is operating to create consciousness, yet in a lot of instances, the brain refers to itself as a brain rather than as me and you. Now, invariably, there's going to be somebody in the comments who's like, oh, it's not really that hard to wrap your mind around it. I'm, no, it is. If you sit down and you really think about it, it's it, it can make you go insane. But coupled with that, our brain's operating by chemicals and electricity to produce this consciousness that we enjoy, or if you have anxiety or depression, probably not enjoy, it doesn't really seem to add up either. At what point with cells interacting does consciousness spring forth? How many cells would really that take? Well, that's the beauty of the brain, because despite what we think we know about neurology, well, reality is we don't really know that much. But what we do know is that certain areas of the brain are responsible for our perception of the world and how we interact with it. In this instance, I'm referring to specifically the Broca's area, also known as the motor speech area, located in the inferior frontal gyrus. And this area helps us regulate our vocalizations and breathing patterns needed for regular speech. And next, we have the Wernicke's area in the back third upper temporal area in the left hemisphere of the brain, which is known as the auditory cortex. These two areas explain the physical manifestation of what happens internally in a person once being infected. Now, once a person hears a term of endearment in English, this will create a neural firing pattern. This firing pattern, for reasons unknown for now, would assumedly be the same in every person based on what they heard and their understanding of what that word means. It may not be completely the same, but for now, let's at least assume that they are similar. When hearing a word, it produces a real-world physical reaction within the brain of a person. Like right now, for instance, me talking 
talking to you is causing your neurons to fire and you to think about what I'm saying on a word for word basis. This would be the same thing when hearing these words. Once these words are heard, something different seems to happen though. First, after hearing, it appears that the Broca's area is affected first by causing you to misremember words until it finally resulted in a compromised understanding of all words. The closest thing we have to this would be known as aphasia, which has always been kind of a horrifying prospect. Aphasia is simply brain damage, most times brought on by a stroke, that causes a person to be able to physically hear what people are talking about, however the brain is no longer auto-translating what is being said into something understandable to the person, as those neurons have been destroyed by the damage. Because of this, they are left in a life of not understanding the meaning of what others are saying or writing. They can try to talk, but most times the words come out mixed up, or they completely lose the ability to talk, and depending on the severity, this may be reversed to a degree, or sometimes spontaneous recovery can take place, but in a lot of people, the person is left in a state of communication being unachievable. And that's likely a very lonely existence, but on top of that, aphasia denotes something more serious being the underlying cause, which means that life expectancy of the person is affected as well, and this could lead to issues like difficulty swallowing and the decline of the person overall. It seems like with this specific disease, the process is as such. Once contracted by reading or hearing the word, the Wernicke's area is the first to be hit. For some reason, the neurons will fire and then fire again and again in an almost seizure-like pattern. These micro seizures, however, continue to spread to the rest of the brain until it becomes a full-blown seizure. We see this happening at first with the person repeating words as it spreads to the Broca's area. From here, confusion sets in for the person as they cannot understand exactly why they are repeating the things, but it seems to continue on the same pathway, leaving the person momentarily catatonic, as with Laurel Ann. Now, her expression of the disease may have been different as this is really only one person we have to go off of, but the way Dr. Mendez made it sound, this is basically the standard. Because of the severity of the seizure, the person after will display symptoms of being almost zombified. Conscious thought as we know it appears to have been completely disrupted and instead it will revert back to more animalistic tendencies. Now the problem here is though, well actually there are two problems, why does the changing of words actually stop the process and why would their natural instinct be to spread the disease? Well let's start with the first one. Once the seizure has begun, this appears to be a self-replicating signal within the brain, firing more and more, activating more and more areas of the brain towards its eventual end. But remember, if a word and its understanding are intrinsically linked, this means there is a physical link between the two based on neural connections and firing patterns. By breaking the meaning, you are literally rerouting the signal to a new meaning, and by doing so, this may break the self-replicating signal and firing pattern. And there's one way I can sort of make you visualize this. A lot of times we think we have no power over the thoughts in our head, but we actually do. So here's two examples. It is well known that if you're, say, tearing yourself down in your thoughts in your head, the typical process to undergo is to yell stop within your mind. This can actually disrupt the pattern of thinking and put a stop to it. Again, why would the brain do this to itself to hurt itself? Because it's the human brain. It's absolutely ridiculous. The other lesser known thing about the human brain is if, let's say you want to zone out, simply say in your head, my next thought will be. And typically, it takes your brain a few seconds to come up with something, but a lot of times it just won't, and then you can zone out. It seems the process of thinking about thinking and being actively aware that you are thinking can literally disrupt thinking. This is the same process with disrupting the oncoming seizure associated with this new disease. By thinking of something else or relating it, it literally disrupts it, causing it to cease. And this is also why thinking and speaking in a different language disrupts it too, as those actually have physical effects on the brain. The doctor was clearly infected, but by going back to his native language, he was able to disrupt the process before turning. However, by speaking English and understanding that he knew how to connect those words to meaning, he would once again be turned if he continued using English. So to those who use English exclusively, the only way out was to change the meanings, thus disrupting the thinking pattern and the inevitable change. It seems some people attempted or had a natural inclination towards doing this by repeating the word over and over again, but this was more likely just brought on by the same neurons firing over and over again, forcing them to say the word. Now let's say it was a defense, right? The issue is that even if you repeat something, you still know what it is. It may sound weird, but you know what that is, so those neurons are still physically linked to make you understand, oh, a uh, water bottle is container for water. There you go. Or visualize a water bottle in your head. Congratulations, you've linked sections of your brain. The next question is, why would you physically want to spread this disease? And to understand this, we're gonna have to kind of get a little metaphysical with it because really it is posited outside of the reality of human sense of perception, at least in a sense of how we would understand and make the world around us make sense. So let me see if I can explain it this way. Taking our understanding of the universe, it can be boiled down to this. 1% is what we know. 2% is what we know we don't know, and 97% is what we don't know that we don't know. The point is, in our brief existence, there is a crazy amount of information that we just don't have any clue that's still out there. Antibiotics seem so normalized to us 
now, but 100 years ago, the very concept would have seemed completely foreign. It would have almost been incomprehensible. Again, explain a TV remote to someone from the Dark Ages, show a caveman a car, have someone from the future come back right now and tell us how time machines work. To us currently, there are either things that are or are not. Surely there's no third thing. Well, it turns out the third thing makes up the bulk of what's out there. Because of this explanation, when it comes to this mystery disease, this means it's a conscious disease, not a physical one, which sounds a little far-fetched, doesn't it? I mean, after all, we are in control of our bodies, right? Well, not exactly. We are absolutely susceptible to physical influence brought on by consciousness. Take the dancing plague of 1518, where in July, a woman began to dance in the streets of the Holy Roman Empire. By September, it finally subsided, but not before 50 to 400 people a day joined in on her dancing. It is said that up to 15 people a day just completely dropped, literally dancing themselves into a horizontal permanent nap. Now, take it with a grain of salt, but if it did happen this way, there's not many things that would likely cause this. Some have hypothesized it, that it could have just been, you know, either food poisoning by the chemical products of ergot fungi, or the constant stress from that era caused people to just sort of snap. But the point is, something caused people to dance to their alleged end by either physical means, social means, or something else, bringing up the point that humans are quite susceptible to doing things like this given the right circumstances. If the stress factor is to be believed, we all know in the movie that they talked about seasonal affective disorder, meaning that stress from you know, storms and the winter and everything else could have affected them to this level. But I still believe it has something to do more with outside of the human perception. I'm attempting to wrap this bad boy up, but basically, we being three-dimensional creatures struggle to grasp outside dimensions. I know, we're going there, so buckle up on this one. Explaining a line to a dot is impossible. Explaining a cube to a line is impossible. Explaining a tesseract to a cube is impossible. With our minds, we can firmly grasp the third dimension as we see it every day, and we are even aware of the fourth dimension as we feel it passing every day, that being time. So let me ask you, what have you ever noticed the fifth dimension, or the sixth? You are aware of lower dimensions, such as length and height, and of course our own incorporating width, but the higher dimensions you are not so much aware of. And this is what I believe might be happening. A higher dimension could be completely aware of us, anything located within that could be seeing us, yet we ourselves could never perceive it as it is beyond our understanding. Much like this disease taking off, this suggests that it's a new order of life as it's never been seen before, or really, it doesn't even seem like it should be possible. To me, seeing as this is consciousness and neural firing patterns that we are talking about, it must reside within the third dimension as we know it, but possibly a disease from a higher dimension has bled over into ours. And I'm not literally saying, oh, this, this higher dimension's attacking us, but if things are around each other long enough, it could track that things could spread, sort of like how SIV became HIV, simply because humans were around the virus long enough. And this would make seemingly random certain words become infected. I know this explanation as to what this is may be a little out there, but when it comes to physical biology, explaining this disease is like being asked to describe the color green to someone who's never seen it before. In your mind, you know what green is, unless there's like color blindness that runs in your family, but apart from, well, you know, it's green, there's no actual way to describe what you're seeing with the limited form of communication that humans have. This is a lot like the disease. Due to our limited ability to actually describe and comprehend what is happening, I believe that's what makes the words contaminated. It just so happened to be English. It really could have been any word in any language, but with these words contaminated, it has real world consequences on the human mind and body. These literally become a breakdown of the body, inducing madness into anyone who is afflicted, and just like any disease, it wants to spread. By unknown strings, the person is pulled and directed towards spreading it, which again, is likely outside of our perception. But by those who figured out to actually change the meaning of the word, the contaminated words no longer induce the same firing pattern as before, and because of that, lose their ability to afflict a person. And should a person not reach another person to infect, then their conscious disease would literally begin breaking down in a way which we just really don't know because the effects of it aren't understood in any capacity. But to wrap this up, hopefully I didn't sound like a complete pompous jackass, it's just literally the disease is unknowable, but the physical effects are definitely observable.